Thank you very much. I'm glad to see everyone here today. Now turn to your neighbor and say, I'm very happy to see you. Finally, we've waited and waited for the quarantines to finish, but they continue. So we're going to meet now on Fridays. Uh, today's our first service, our first pilot project. Uh, and praise God, it's wonderful to see everyone here today. Last week, a, an associate of the Akimat called and said, I wanted to meet with you. And I said, why? Why do we need to meet? Now, I don't really like these bureaucratic official meetings, but he was very insistent. So I agreed and we agreed to meet. I said, five minutes. I will just greet each other and that'll be it. So I went to the meeting and had the goal to spend one or five minutes and we spent more than an hour. And there were two reasons. It turned out that we were actually from the same place in Eastern Kazakhstan and we had a lot in common. And secondly, he had a question. He said, why is your church named an, evangel an evangelistic church? And how could I say in five minutes what an evangelistic church is? So we had a really, really good discussion. And as I was preparing for the sermon today, I realized that it really is important. Why are we called evangelistic believers? What is it in the word evangelism that's so important that we put it in the name of our church? And what's the word? How does that understanding influence and impact our lives? That's what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to continue going through the book of the Acts and verse or chapter 8. Verses 1 through 25, and we'll go ahead and start reading. You can read along if you have a Bible in front of you. So chapter 8 from ch verse 1. On, and Saul approved of their killing him. And here it's talking about uh, Stephen from the last chapter. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in that city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him attention and exclaimed, This man was rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit, when Simon saw that the spear was given with the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this matter, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said might happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Amen. So this is the story that we have today. So what do we see? Well, at first, it's very important to see there's characteristics of the event, of the gospel. And secondly, we see examples of how this gospel influences on the lives of people and also, unfortunately, how it doesn't impact people. So let's see some of these characteristics of the gospel, of the gospel. So what is the gospel? It's the plan of God. It's from the very beginning. God planned to bless people. For the book of Genesis and, and chapter 3, it says that God's going to uh, 
resolve the issues of sin through a son that's going to come from woman and uh, the problem of sin will be resolved and people will be saved. God will save all people from the power of Satan, from the power of sin. And this process is going to start in Jerusalem. Jesus said in the very uh, first book of Acts, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's just the plan of God. Jesus uh, emphasized this plan and we see how this plan is at work today. God is enacting this plan. And other than that, God said, this plan is going to see opposition. It's going to have physical, spiritual opposition from people and from demonic powers. And we see this starting from the very first chapter. We see opposition. This is opposition initially first against the apostles. And we see that people persecuted the apostles, put them in jail, uh, beat them. And in the last two chapters, we saw how uh, this opposition was directed against a lot of the different leaders of the church, against St Stephen and others. And today, now we see this opposition is directed against not just the leaders, but now against the whole church. You see, it's a very uh, serious persecution that's broken out against all of Jerusalem. But these difficult circumstances don't stop the gospel. It doesn't stop God's plan. It, quite the opposite. It actually increases the radius of the gospel and... That's what God talked about from the very beginning. So, of, Kate, of course, we're all likely hearing about news in Afghanistan. It's very critical. No one knows what's going to happen. And from one side, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. We don't have to uh, bite our nails and, and dramatize what's going on. We don't need to text each other saying that uh, Christians are being, uh, are being crucified or, or killed. Uh, that's probably not happening right now. But on the other side, we don't want to close our eyes to the possible risks that there will be for believers. And we know that there's different scenarios and persecution of believers is, and potentially the death or martyrdom of people is likely true as well. So if we can't physically help people in Afghanistan in this situation, so what's our responsibility in this situation? We can pray for them. We can pray for them. And the question is now, what do we pray for them before all. We want to pray for their physical safety uh, of believers and also the blessing for all of Afghanistan. But this doesn't need to be the only prayer. Let's read this story today. We see how God allowed persecution and allowed the death of believers, and he used that to expand the gospel. And in that, we need to have um, our testimony. We, we need to have an awareness that yes, it's sad when there's believers who are, are die or who die, uh, but in that God can still use them. God can still even use their death, like He used the death of Stephen. And that's what we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan. So, if the time comes for them to uh, to suffer and be persecuted, let's pray that they are suffering and persecuting in a manner worthy of Jesus. That they expand the gospel through what they're going through. And because we see that God uses difficult situations like he does in the lives of the church at first, and he expands the gospel, he expands his kingdom through that. Besides that, another characteristic of the gospel is included in that the expansion of the gospel more often relies on the Holy Spirit's power and a lot less often relies on any sort of factor coming from us. And praise God, we are an imperfect people, and the apostles were imperfect people. In this uh, chapter, we see kind of an ironic situation. And think about who did Jesus give the Great Commission that you will receive power when the Holy come and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, without doubt, without question, he said it to the apostles. And you see that there's a persecution against the church. And everyone left uh, Jerusalem and went to Samaria and other places, and they were preaching the gospel. And these were, these were plain believers. They were new believers. All of them left Jerusalem like Jesus, le like Jesus commanded them, except for the apostles. It says everyone left other than the apostles. So Jesus told the apostles, 
hey, brothers, don't sit forever in Jerusalem. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you need to preach in Jerusalem, go out of the city to the uh, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So everyone left except for the apostles. So we need to understand the apostles are just like us. Yeah, there were times when they had great faith and they made signs and wonders when Peter preached and 3,000 and 5,000 believed. In other days, they're just like ordinary people. And they say, man, we need a little bit of comfort. We need to rest. We need to sit. And the apostles are carrying themselves on like ordinary people, like you and I. And in this, there's a little bit of joy and, and, and freedom because we see that the expansion of the gospel did not depend on the perfection and uh, perfect nature of the disciples. And praise God, because we're not like that. We're not perfect. The gospel does not depend on our uh, holiness or righteousness. And that's great news for you and I. So, of course, the apostles later heard that the Samaritans were uh, coming into the kingdom, and so they went and they checked, and, and they went uh, and they preached. And you see that they're preaching in the Samaritan um, towns, but that was at the end of the story, not at the beginning. So uh, to see, this applies to us today, to preach the gospel, we don't necessarily need great apostles to come and preach uh, and uh, do it over YouTube or something. God can use regular, ordinary people just like he uses in this chapter, to expand his church, to preach the gospel. And it's actually much more common that people believe from ordinary people than from some super apostles. Okay, so another characteristic of the gospel. Before all, it's the gospel of Jesus. Let's look from 5 to verse 12. It's the gospel of Jesus. Philip came to these Samaritan, uh, Samaritan towns and he preached Jesus. And he was preaching of the name of Jesus. He was driving out spirits. So his, his preaching wasn't just religious discussion. He's preaching Jesus. He's expanding the name of Jesus, preaching his gospel in the same way that Stephen did. Because this is the base. This is the foundation. This is the gospel. What Jesus did on the earth. How he came to the earth. How he lived. How he taught. How he uh, fed. How he uh, instructed, and how he's the promised Messiah of Jesus, or promised Messiah of God. How he died, how he rose, how he lives in heaven, and how he's the King of all kings for all of eternity. We believe in this. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. But we see that Philip didn't just go and preach religious sermons. We see that the evangelism, the gospel in his life, was demonstrated through supernatural demonstrations by the Holy Spirit. And it says that uh, the people heard, they were all, they paid close attention to what he said. They were focused on Philip. Now, the Samaritans, who are the enemies of the Jews, are focusing and paying attention to the gospel and believing. Why? Because it wasn't just a religious discussion. It, they heard the gospel and they saw how it was uh, working through the Holy Spirit's power. And a lot of people went and they believed and it shows that a lot of people who were lame uh, could now walk. And you see in verse 13 that Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed uh, and he was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And to this day, you know, we need to pray for this and we need to wait for this, uh, for the Holy Spirit to work power when we're preaching the gospel to unbelievers. But we also need to understand that our task and the results don't just depend from our impressive speech. Yes, we need to learn how to uh, clearly and concisely explain the gospel. Who's Jesus? What did you do? What's the result? What's our responsibility? We need to be able to clearly explain that gospel. That's why it's important to have training uh, and sharing the good news, like the four spiritual laws. I encourage everyone, if you haven't uh, gone through some sort of training in how to clearly, concisely uh, explain the gospel, I encourage you to do that. But that's not the end goal. We understand that without the Holy Spirit moving in a person, he's not going to understand, he's not going to believe and see the beauty of the gospel and the love of God in his life. So, of course, we need to pray for people, and we need to ask the Holy Spirit to move 
in people and to move someone's heart. And we also need to ask God to use His Holy Spirit to demonstrate through signs and healings. Through uh, We need to pray for that. We need to wait for that. But the most amazing miracle that we want to see in someone is repentance. We want to see repentance in a person's life and them turning to God. And without the Holy Spirit working in someone, our work is nothing. It's meaningless without God moving. And that's what you see Philip uh, demonstrating in the Samaritan town. They see that Philip is not just preaching a sermon. They see that the Holy Spirit's moving and, and working in power. And we need to see, like it says, uh, preaching is not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So, And of course, we can't manipulate God. We can't force Him to do anything. But we can pray and ask God to work in people's hearts. And through God's power, through His strength, He can work in people's hearts and He can draw them to Himself to lead them to repentance. It's interesting to note in today's story what kind of miracles were in these people. There were two big miracles. And first we see the spiritual uh, move and, and people turning to repentance away from um, from different uh, strongholds. And that's the first healing. But the second one is interesting. It says that there were a lot of people who were lame, people who were paralyzed, and people who couldn't move. And, and why is it that people were healed in with these conditions. Why wasn't it people with heartaches or heart conditions or toothaches? Uh, what does paralyzm have to do? It's it's because people couldn't move. They couldn't they couldn't walk. And listen to God's sense of humor. He just told the disciples to go to move and preach the gospel, and they're sitting in Jerusalem. So God says, okay. These Samaritans who can't move, who can't walk, I'm going to make it so that they can go, they can walk, and they can share the gospel. So it's funny. You remember the uh, temple leaders told Jesus, tell the children to be quiet. And Jesus said, if these children are quiet, then the rocks will cry out. God is not limited in his resources. He can make the paralyzed and the lame move so that they can share the gospel. You know, this is like us in many ways. At one time, we were all paralyzed. We were all lame spiritually. But God has given us spiritual strength. He's given us healing to move. Uh, you know, in the sermon, last sermon, there was someone that stood up and said, I'm kind of limping. And we prayed for him. And we prayed for that person. We prayed not just that she would be able to walk, but that she would be able to walk and share the gospel. And so we see, how does this gospel expand? Let's look at another characteristic of the gospel in today's text. It's available to everyone in every category. Look at this giant uh, span of people from Jews to Samaritans who are accepting the gospel. It's for people that we love and people that maybe we don't like so much from different cultures, different languages, different uh, countries. You know, Even those people, God sends us to them. God sends us to them to share the gospel. Men, women... It says several times here, uh, both men and women, people great and not so great, uh, people that are sick and not. It was, uh, it's people for even the, the demon-possessed are receiving the gospel and being healed. So it doesn't matter. Whatever category you're in today, the gospel is for you. It's something that God can use. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So what do we see? What do we need from this? Let's look at the story. The reaction of people. There's three main reactions. One reaction is from three different parts. They rejoice in the gospel is the first part. Because the very word the gospel comes from a Greek word that translates to good news. That's what the gospel means. It's the good news. So it, it, it uh, communicates the sense that when we hear the gospel, we need to rejoice. It's it's wonderful. So before the Samaritans, or after the Samaritans read the, or heard the gospel, they rejoiced. They were so happy. And that's the impact of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our heart and helps us understand that God gave his son, that we wouldn't die, that we wouldn't perish, but that we would have eternal life. That's a great story. That's wonderful news. 
we should rejoice. That's the gospel. That's good news. So it's not just that they're rejoicing and hearing Jesus, but they're believing in Jesus. So they believed in those who were preaching the good news to them. And the third thing that you see is that they, they repented. They were baptized into Jesus. And you see that this is a public declaration of someone's faith, that before when someone was, uh, was um, chained to their sins, they hear the gospel, they can't argue with it, they understand that this is God, this is what he's doing, this is, and the person repents and said, God, I surrender, I give up, I understand that Jesus is my Savior, I want to live with Jesus, I want Jesus to live in me, I want people um, that maybe have known me as only practicing uh, cult practices, I want those people to see that I'm going to be baptized in Jesus, I'm going to be buried with him in the water, and I'm going to be raised uh, with him to live as a clean and new person. And so, praise God, uh, uh, someone called me this last week that said that they'd led some people to Christ, and these two men uh, had been um, had repented, and now they want to be baptized. And praise God that even in today's COVID environment, they're repenting, they're accepting the good news. And that's our responsibility. We need to believe, we need to hear, we need to repent and believe in Jesus and be baptized in his name. So everything would be great in this story if we didn't have Simon here. So Simon shows up in the story, and we see he's very ambitious, very young. Maybe we don't know if he's so young, but he's charismatic. He's a very bright personality, uh, very famous here. And it says that he, you know, we see he's not the only Simon that we see in the Bible. Um, there's another Simon, or Simon Peter. But this Simon uh, is involved in impressing people. He's very popular. And people count him to be someone great, and they're amazed at him. And they see that he's doing astonishing signs. So this Simon, he goes through the same process as all the other Samaritans. It says that he heard and rejoiced. He was baptized after he repented into the name of Jesus. So now you see the other Simon, Simon Peter, come. And tells this other Simon, this new Samaritan Simon, that he's going straight to hell. So let's look. In verse 20, Peter says, uh, you are going to perish. So how, how can someone say to someone that just believed in Jesus and was repent, or repented and was baptized that they're going to hell? What was his problem? The problem wasn't that Simon lost his salvation. Like a lot of people say, oh, a person can't lose their salvation. It's a completely different problem. It's not external. Or it's not, yeah, externally he was uh, receiving baptism, he was rejoicing, and, and look, he even found a mentor. It says every day he was following Philip. And, and in fact, actually, that's a great thing to focus on because we need to all have spiritual mentors that we can follow, that we can learn from. And it says that Simon found that every day he was following Philip around. And it's also saying that he's, he's offering, uh, you know, a tithe. It's, it's not his external actions. The problem is inside. It's internal. And Peter says that the problem is with his heart, the state of his heart. Two times he repeats Peter repeats that, Simon, you've got a problem, not with external things, but with your heart, internal. He said, your heart is not right before God. Secondly, he said that your heart is full of bitterness and it's captive to sin. So the heart, the heart that's covered in the blood of Jesus, it's right before God. It's right, uh, not in its own strength, but it's right because it's covered with Christ. So Peter here says to Simon that his heart was full of bitterness. If you guys have ever, if anyone here has ever um, had an animal that they were uh, skinning, you know, sorry for the, the gory details, but every animal has a uh, an intestinal 
uh, sack, it's, uh, it's filled with bile. It's filled with just uh, bitter stuff. And you have to very carefully take it out and throw it away if you're skinning an animal. And why? Because if a drop of that bile gets on the meat, you can't eat the meat. It's, it's so powerful. It's so gross. And that's how powerful this bile is. And Peter says to Simon, your heart isn't just a drop of bile. It says it's full of bitterness and captive to sin. The third thing that Peter says to Simon is that his heart is chained. It's, it's uh, captive to sin. He's believing lies. So how, how did Peter see the condition of Simon's heart? Externally, he looked okay. He believed. He was going to church. He was rejoicing. He was baptized. He was tithing. He's following a mentor around. How did Peter see his heart? In this section, we see that there's three things that show that Simon's heart was not right. First, it's the lust or desire for power. And Peter says, or Simon said to the disciples, give me this power. I want this power of the Holy Spirit so that I can control people. He was so hungry for power. He wanted to be able to manipulate people and, and, and get their praise and get their respect. He wanted even more power. He wanted people to see him and see the great things that he could do. He said, give me that power. I need that power. And Peter said, this is a problem, Simon. The second thing Simon had, he wanted the praise of people. He was very popular. Every people, Everyone in the town respected him and thought he was someone great. He had his own YouTube channel. You know, people were running around and saying, man, look at this great guy, Simon. And they even thought he was God in the flesh. And he wanted even more praise from people. And he was thinking, how many more people I could heal? How much more popularity I could gain? I could have my own helicopter. And the third thing that you see is the love of money. He's carrying this money around. He's thinking, how do I invest this money? And how can I invest it so that I can get something from it? And we see this problem in a lot of uh, believers, especially when it comes to the tithe. You know, a lot of people uh, put their tithe in the offering plate and say, okay, God, I'm going to give this money to you, but you need to give these things to me because of this. We feel like we're buying God. Buying God. That's the same thing that Simon's doing here. He's trying to buy the Holy Spirit. Peter says, brother, you've got big problems with the condition of your heart. You got love of power, the love of praise, and the love of money. And this is the same thing that you see in Judas uh, Iscariot. He, he wanted power, uh, he wanted money uh, in exchange from his in exchange for his uh, relationship with Jesus, he wanted some sort of monetary reward. And And this happens a lot when people want to look spiritual, but at the same time just follow their own desires. And you see this with Simon. He, he wants to use spiritual uh, things to have personal gain. And Peter calls him out. He says, if your heart is focused on getting praise and power and money, then nothing but hell is waiting for you. You have no part in God's kingdom. And this is a really important thing that we need to think about. We need to think about the condition of our own heart. Is this a problem in our heart, in my heart? Does, am I motivated by these things? Do I want to have more power so that I can control people? Do I want more praise from people? So that I can, do I want to be able to use my spiritual actions to have financial or personal reward? You know, this is a first indication that we need to uh, latch on to and realize that our heart is not in the right place. But if we can honestly answer and say, no, I have no uh, desire for power or, or gain or praise, um, well, we need to ask other people too. Uh, ask our wife, ask other people that know us well, and allow them to honestly tell us 
if we have tendencies to manipulate people, to try to control people? Do we have tendencies to uh, desire praise from people? And in some ways, do we do we have some financial uh, you know, swindling or, or improper dealings? And if people tell us that we do, let's not take offense. Let's realize that they love us. And the first step that we can take after that is repentance. So here in the story, we, we need to see the balance. Yes, it's our responsibility to believe and understand that our, our salvation is eternal. Um, it's a, an important doctrine in the faith, eternal salvation. We need to know that we're in God's hands, and God said that no one can take um, them out of God's hands. No one can take us out of God's hands. And, you know, uh, Paul talked about nothing can separate us from the love of God, and he had a lot of details to that. So we need to understand that we do have this eternal salvation from God. We don't need to be afraid of this. If we're with God, he's going to bring us through all trials and to eternity because we're in God's hands. Our salvation is from him. His love for us is eternal. Uh, he gave his son for us. And if we're in God's hands, we don't need to be afraid. But at the same time, the Apostle Paul said, test yourself to see if you're in your faith. Let's do it daily. Do we love God? Are we obeying him? Let's test our heart to see if we're in the faith. Do we have bitterness in our heart? Do we have desire for praise? Do we have a desire for power? Do we have desire for personal gain? If there is, what do we do? Peter says it's not the end. It's the beginning. It's maybe a painful beginning, but it's the beginning. We have an exit. So what is it? Peter gives Simon three things. He says, first, you need to repent, you need prayer, and you need hope. And look, Peter says, repent. He says, repent of this wickedness, the sin. You're in a broken condition. You are going straight to hell along with your money. So what's this repentance? This is a process of agreeing with God. It's agreeing that, God, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong condition. I want to be uh, different. I want to be in your place, God. I want to be in your, uh, where you want me to be. And Peter's telling Simon to do this. He's telling him to repent and be right with God. And you remember the person that came into the temple, the tax collector that was beating his chest and not even looking to heaven because he said, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. This is the process of repentance. We need to say, God, I'm a sinner, and I want to turn from my ways to your ways. That's a prayer of repentance. But that's not something that works by a formula. We don't just say, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to pray. You know, It's not a formula that Peter says. Peter says, maybe God will grant you repentance. We need to understand it's not a guarantee Yes, we do want to pray and we do want to encourage someone to repent. But we don't know their heart. We don't know if they're sincerely repenting if they go through a prayer. It's their heart. If they're sincerely praying, if they're sincerely repenting, God can forgive them because Jesus died for them. We have hope. It's a gift of God. It's not something that we can gain or, or earn or work for. But we can ask God, and we can ask God to lead people to repentance and to lead them to forgiveness. So that's how it works. So was Simon ready to repent and believe and turn? No. No, he puts the responsibility on someone else and says, uh, well, why don't you pray for me? That sounds okay, right? But that's not how it works. You, you don't get into heaven in someone else's clothes. When people walked into church today, did you guys have your Ashik app checked? You know, when we, we go to different places, we have, you know, checks that people uh, want to verify. And, and maybe, yeah, today in, with technology, you can uh, fake something like the Ashik app out. But when we go to heaven, there's no faking. There's no getting by on a fake ID. 
The only QR code that you need to get scanned into heaven with is the one of Jesus. That's the gospel. There's no other way to God. There's no other way for us to say, hey, let's have someone else pray for me. No, it's your own personal response to God. You will have to answer to the judgment seat of God personally. And repentance is a trial. It's, it's painful. It's uncomfortable. But every person needs to go through repentance. Without repentance, there's no hope. There's no eternal life. Simon didn't go through this, this trial. We read stories of, of uh, stu- uh, people that study this time, and they say that Simon continued in his ways. He was manipulating people. Um, people say that he was one of the adherents of agnosticism that believe that we uh, that uh, belief or salvation wasn't from Jesus, but it was from some spiritual things. Um, but in this story, we see that there's another person who's even worse than Simon. Simon at least was trying to heal people, but this other guy that we saw in the very beginning, he was killing people. His name is Saul. He was killing people, believers. But in the end, when it was his turn, he repented, which is different from what Simon uh, did in the story. But now we're going to pray. Father God, thank you that today we can gather to de- uh, together. Praise God that it's after so long. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, to be I gathered together. It's like oil flowing down the beard of Aaron. God, we praise you, and we praise you for all that you've given us. God, thank you that it's an opportunity that we can be in your presence, that we can open our hearts to you, that we can pray before you, that we can listen to your word, read your word, meditate on your word, and and dwell in your word, God, and, and apply it to our life, that we can dwell in your gospel. God, we thank you for the gospel. Thank you, God, that uh, the gospel is in the name of our church. Thank you that it's in the life of every one of us. God, thank you that in our past, in our present, in our future, we can experience the gospel. Thank you that the gospel changes everything, that it can influence everything. Our past, our, our presence our present today is in you, and we're in your hands, God. No one can take us out of your hands. And our future is with Jesus. It's safe and secure. But God, please prevent us from being self-deceived. God, help us to test every single day. Are we in the faith? Do we love you? Do we love those around us? Are there problems with our hearts? Is there bitterness? Is there, uh, are we captive to sin? Are we covered? Is our heart covered in the blood of Christ? God, thank you for today's word. We praise you, God, for your gospel, for your story, for your plan that's not developing over thousands of years. God, it hasn't been stopped. It hasn't been stopped by crises or persecution. God, it's not based on our, our perfection. It's not based on, uh, it's not slowed down by our, imperfections, God, your gospel is expanding and it's going to all the world. And God, that'll continue until you come. Thank you, God, that we have the privilege to be part of your plan, that we get to be part of your church, part of your kingdom, part of your message. God, use us like you use the ordinary people, believers in Jerusalem, to go and to go from our Jerusalem, God, to go into all of Judea and Samaria, to preach the gospel, God, in the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we trust you. God, we pray also for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. God, a special prayer we lift up to you, God. We don't know what's going to happen there. God, we, we would love for them to live comfortably and to live in safety. And God, if there's a, if there's a way for them to, to have that, we pray for that pray that you'd protect their lives, the lives of uh, men and women that believe in you. God, we also pray for the entire country of Afghanistan. We pray that you'd give your holy light. God, as we see the, the threats and the, the fear all around us, God, we pray that, that every one of us, God, uh, would be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. 
And God, if it's your will that we go through trials and persecution and death even, God, we pray that people that go through that would die uh, in a worthy manner, God, for you. God, we pray that you would strengthen us, that you'd strengthen us in prayer, that we would continue in prayer for brothers and sisters who are going through persecution, who are going through trials. God, that we wouldn't be spiritually asleep, but God, that we would experience the privilege and the power that you give us to walk in your spirit. God, that we thank you that we have a wonderful country uh, such as Kazakhstan, that we can live out the gospel, God, that we don't have to be afraid of being uh, put in prison or something even worse, God. We, we thank you for that. Please help us to not be silent, God. Please help us to not sit as the apostles were sitting in Jerusalem, God. Help us to, to move our, our creaky legs, God, and move out to share the gospel, God. We pray this, that we would share your gospel through your spirit and save people, God. We pray that you would bless all of our relatives and neighbors and, and even people that we don't love, God. We pray that you would bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. We trust you with our lives all of this next week, this weekend. We pray this in your name. Amen. So now we have the Lord's Supper. And Jesus said before he left that every time you gather together, uh, eat this and drink this in remembrance of me. I'm with you. And Jesus is with us through all trials. And we can eat and we can drink and we can pray. If you need healing, uh, accept, receive healing from God. If you need strengthening, pray. Jesus is with us. We can depend on him. He's here with us even today. Let's go ahead and, and bring up our praise and worship team. And when you're ready, go ahead and eat and participate in the Lord's Supper. God loves you.